Thank you very much. Um, so if I'm a little rusty, that's okay. Um, just uh, kind of roll with it with me, I guess, as I figure this out as I go along. And um, of course, if you have any questions, um, feel free to stop me. Feel free to dive into anything um, that we want to talk about. And I'm always happy to talk after class, of course, too. So a little bit about me to start off, if my slides will work. There we go. Okay, so a little bit about my introduction background. Um, so I grew up and kind of started life in Mount Airy, North Carolina, which is the top kind of uh, uh, left pitcher. Well, actually, that's Winston-Salem, which is also where I went to college, where I got an undergrad uh, dual BS in mathematics and physics um, and was one course away from chemistry minor, but that's fine. No worries. Um, I then went to uh, Virginia Tech or um, the uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, as I like to call it, because it sounds fancy, up there on the top right, uh, for my PhD, where I focused on mostly um, nanomechanics and molecular dynamics for kind of like condensed matter theory stuff. Um, and then it's been a couple of years at Los Alamos down there on the bottom left, um, mostly working with constitutive modeling and discrete dislocation dynamics for uh, looking at deformation of nuclear steels, and then transferred that knowledge to where I work now, which is at Terra. Terra Power, excuse me, LLC, which is a nuclear innovation country, company uh, homegrown here in Bellevue. So if anyone here is looking at nuclear engineering or thinking about mechanical engineering, it's a really cool place to work. Um, and I'd encourage you sending your resumes there when you, uh, whenever you enter. Um, a little bit, a little bit about me, just in terms of what I enjoy doing personally. Um, I'm big into the outdoors. I actually live over the, over the mountains in Ellensburg, which is a super cool place to like do wilderness exploration and like go hiking and mountains and all that stuff. I love long distance cycling, like off-road cycling too. I'm a big Doom 2 nut and I love like modding and like making levels for the game and new kinds of music and so forth. So that's kind of like my creative space. I'm really good at baking too and I'm perfecting my ciabatta, which is not quite there, but I'm working on it. Um, I love hanging out with friends as well too. Um, when I get the chance, they're mostly further afield now because we're all at graduate school, but whenever I get the chance, yes. When you get a chance, can you um, get rid of the extra pictures on the oh, screen? Because yeah. it's kind of nice to see your face, but um, yeah. Let me try to minimize this guy. Yeah. How's that? That's perfect. Okay. And I like to read too. Uh, Fantasy is probably my favorite. Um, and of course, my girlfriend's there in the back. I'm looking out for her. Oh, that's going to be tough as well. So. And um, this guy always gets a lot of awe, you know, cute stuff. This is my dog, Neil. He's a three year old sable collie. And he's absolutely my best friend. And he's a big, big goofball too. So um, yeah, now for something completely different. Um, so uh, this is one of my favorite comics because it's actually something that happened to me when I was um, a kid. I was driving over a bridge with my dad. We were going on a road trip and I asked him how he knew uh, what the load limit on, on bridges were. And he said, well, it's very simple. So they just drive bigger and bigger trucks over until the bridge breaks. And the truck falls and the, and the driver dies, of course, and then they just rebuild the bridge. You know, it's worth sacrificing that truck. And my mom got really mad at him for that, just like uh, Calvin's mom did here. Um, but funny though this is, it actually raises an important question, which as an engineer, um, you're required to answer for almost anything you're designing, which is when does it break? So this is me right when I got my PhD. Um, I was completely clueless. I just got my diploma, my hard hat, now it's ready to go. But I was presented with some uh, somewhat difficult problems, which is how do you design something complicated that's gonna be under some extreme conditions, like say a car engine or a nanostructure or a wind turbine or a big piece of industrial equipment or something like components for a jet fighter um, or what I work on now, which is nuclear reactors. and all these have wildly different conditions. All these have wildly different applications and different even fundamental mechanics in some places. But you always have to ask the same question when you're an engineer, which is when will it break, how, and under what operating conditions? Now, the good thing about being an engineer is that you don't need to do your design alone. Frequently when you're working on a big complicated system like this, like wind turbine, you don't have to design the whole thing. That'd just be way too much work. Um, and so, when you're working for a company, you'll only, usually you'll have to work on like one or at most two systems at a time to optimize and design them. So um, I'm Patrick here and I got assigned to work on the kind of like drive shaft, the long thing that actually turns the turbine. And then my pal SpongeBob got to work on the gearbox and our coworker, I won't call him a friend, Squidward got to work on the yaw motor. 
Um, and so we all get assigned different things and we have to know the conditions that they're gonna be under and then how to design for them. But it can be a little daunting at times because you have to do kind of all this complicated um, kind of stressful mathematics and you have to understand the conditions that the material is going to be under. Primarily what temperature it's gonna be under, what stress it's gonna be under, if there's like corrosive properties and what material is best for fitting those specific conditions. Um, but I'll walk you through some applications and kind of the process that a lot of engineers go through for figuring this out and how linear algebra kind of fits into all that. So, um, so throughout this presentation, um, I'll talk about the component design process and two questions that an engineer must answer, which is what are the operating conditions, which is to say, how is what I'm designing for going to be banged around? How is it going to be, you know, kind of used? What sorts of stresses and chemical forces and temperatures is it going to be under? And the second question, with those operating conditions, what's the best material and how can you design and optimize material for that? But the ultimate goal of designing a component that maximizes lifespan um, under operating conditions and also fails at a predictable time in a predictable way. Um, question. So you said earlier that like you have each different person who will have giant jumps and front how do you fit them together? Like, how do you know that the, like, what is the right shot that the like, guy from the kill burns? And it's like, you know, there's the person who's got the cure, so you know, they have the project managers. And so they have the, ult the ultimate blueprint for kind of what they want, for how they want the whole kind of like component or the whole design to work together. So he'll tell you, like, um, that's actually a good question because it leads into the next section. He'll tell you, like, okay based on, for example, how, how quickly the, uh, you know, the propeller blade is going to turn, this is the maximum kind of like speed it's going to go at. And that will tell you like the maximum strain or kind of twist that the drive shaft receives, so to speak. Um, and then they will already have a spec for design usually in mind for like the gearbox and they'll hand that to SpongeBob and say, optimize this. So SpongeBob will talk to me and the guy designing the rotor will also talk to me and I'll talk to them and we'll interface talking about our design. It's a long process, it involves a lot of collaboration, but um, in short, there's an interface to a project manager who knows all the different designs and how to kind of link them together. And then the individual senior engineers, which is what I do, kind of like work on the fun nitty gritty stuff, which is how you actually design the thing and kind of optimize it for mechanical, so to speak. Um, so, uh, yeah, good question. And that leads into, um, well, first of all, I'll talk about the outline. I'll talk a bit about continuum mechanics and mechanical engineering going into design, and then also the material science, which is more kind of my wheelhouse, so to speak. Um, so yeah, continuum mechanics and constitutive theory first. So we think about a problem, which we were just looking at, which is like the long drive shaft, Patrick needs to design it to turn at a certain speed. And he knows from his colleagues that the long cylindrical drive shaft will deform at a certain strain um, consistently that will not exceed a certain value. Based on this information, Patrick wants to find out what the stresses of material feels due to this specific strain deformation. And then from that predict how the material will fail or where it will fail. So the first thing Patrick wants to do, he knows how the strain of the component, which is to say how much it will deform or by what fractional kind of percentage it will deform. He wants to calculate what the stress response of the material is, which means internally, the force that will be felt per unit area by said material. Um, now he knows that he can relate this in what's called the elastic regime, which is that green box um, for the material through what's called a constitutive relationship, which is the sigma C E dot um, equation over on the left, which basically just relates a linear stress response from a particular strain within the material um, represented in matrix form, as you can see by the Einstein notation. Now by modeling stress, um, Patrick hopes to see where the material will most likely break or fail in operation um, above a certain stress that can be calculated from this relation. So this is kind of the overall roadmap of what he wants to do. Now, to start off with this, pa Patrick needs to know, Patrick needs to define on a nitty gritty level how his material is actually deforming. So it needs to define something called an occlusion. Um, but before any of that, he needs to find a coordinate system for the reference frame of his material. So 
he knows he has a cylinder. He flips it up to make sure he has like a long Z axis going up this way. And to represent deformation in a, in a long cylinder, he's going to use, of course, cylindrical components. So I'm sure your professors talked to you about this, or maybe you've heard about it in other classes, but um, cylindrical coordinates. So the exact same thing as like X, Y, Z Cartesian, just you're representing by different values. You're representing it by an angle and a radius instead of an X, Y, and Z perspective. Um, and importantly about this, the position of a specific spot in the material represented by this uh, blue kind of box here um, can be, the position can be represented by a vector. Now, another important thing to define for uh, mechanical engineering is what this actual little blue blob is. It's important to have it have some volume, but not so much that it's going to deform a lot. And so you define something called an inclusion, which is basically just an infinitesimally small volume within the material, which is just the d z d rho d phi and rho here is the z value. It's just um, you know basically as small as you can get a volume within a material while still technically defining it as a volume. So you can make a lot of linear assumptions about how it will deform, which is very very useful. So great, we have a vector to represent our material. We have a volume to represent. Uh, kind of a space for it to deform. Now we want to try to capture deformation. So Patrick knows that when the material twists by a certain amount, he's going to see within the reference frame um, the blue component move to the orange component because it's going to twist ever so slightly. And so there'll be a new vector that represents the new position of the material. The original will be this R1, V1, Z1 value, uh, or just big X. And the new or deformed value for this same material will be X prime, so this purple value here. And you can represent the uh, positional change from the blue to the orange by a subtraction of one vector from another. So you just take the big orange guy, subtract it from the purple guy, um, do vector addition. I'm sure you've talked about this in the early part of your class, and you get the red line, which is called the displacement, going from the original position to the new or deformed <laughs> position. Now, this is great. This tells you how single spot material deforms, but it doesn't tell you everything. Displacements are useful, but they only apply to one part, which is to say one infinitesimal point in the, um, in the material you're looking at. Um, and it can't account for complex deformations. So you look at like your Rubik's cube here. If I want to take this Rubik's cube to this twisted guy over here, which I kind of want to buy that, that looks like a good tool. But, um, there's two things going on here. You see the red part flipped up to the top and then it got twisted. So somehow I need to come up with something that accounts for the flipping over and the twisting deformation of this guy. Um, and to do this, we use something called a deformation grade. And this is kind of the crux of everything you're going to use in uh, continuum mechanics. And as scary as it looks, it's actually very, very simple. It's just um, you take the uh, the X, Y, and Z, or in this case, the R, Z, and phi coordinates of your uh, new position. And then um, in, a, in a three by three matrix, um, do the DX over D big X of the original position. So it's the change in every new position over the change in the original position. And this is kind of the foundation by which you can capture the nature or the character, so to speak, any sort of deformation. So if you want to squash it, or you want to twist, or you want to do a twist and a squash, or whatever condition your material is going to be under, you can capture it with this guy. Um, so that's kind of abstract. Let's look at a let's look at an example. So um, let's take something like the picture to the far right, where you have an original box, which is the purple outline that goes through a rotation by some angle and then kind of a stretch. So I'm rotating it and then I'm pulling. Um, well, I can decompose the deformation gradient into two components, um, which are the dot products of each other, which is a uh, rotation matrix and then also a deformation matrix, um, which basically says you have one part of your system, which is kind of like doing the rotating part and the one parting that's actually doing the stretching part. And you can find this really easily by just doing some matrix algebra. You take the transpose of your original guy, dot it with your original. And if you go through the matrix algebra, what you find is that you get um, r dot u, t times r dot u. Um, but when you transpose the original guy, you get r t times r t. 
Now, rotation matrices, I don't know if you guys have covered this yet, but rotation matrices um, will always have character when you dot the transpose with the original, you're going to get what's called the identity, which is just the one by one matrix, which a matrix addition is like multiplying by one. So that goes away, you get ut dot u, which doesn't have any like symmetry properties and force on it. So you can then uh, take out what are called the eigenvectors and define the vector u or the stretch from that guy. Once you have the stretch, you can just dot the inverse with the original and then um, expand out f, cancel out the inverse of the matrix with itself, get the rotation. So you can break it down in that way. Relatively straightforward, pretty easy to do once you have the original deformation gradient. Um, so applied to the problem we're looking at, how does this apply to torsion? Um, now, initially torsion may just look like we're rotating the bar, but keep in mind, the bottom plate of that material is staying stationary. So the part that's actually on the ZX axis for that cylinder over there stays still while the blue guy continues to rotate. And if you represent this just in terms of Z and Phi, so if you look at the z coordinate of the blue guy and where it goes in terms of height, you're going to see what's sort of like a shear, which is represented by the z over phi kind of graph there on the bottom. So you're going to see a slight deformation, which if we uh, plot out our deformation gradient, which is just the you know dr over d everything on top, d phi over d everything, and dz over d everything, the only thing that won't come out to zero, which is to say the only change in a certain coordinate that isn't equivalent to a change in another coordinate is this d phi over dc. And as you can see, as you go up in z, you have a change in phi. So you have a change in phi over a change of z. That becomes a certain value k. Um, and then you go through this whole process, which because I'm an engineer and I'm not a mathematician, I don't need to do. I can just let a computer do it. Um, I can break this down into its respective um, deformation part and then rotation part easy as pie. Um, so now, this is great. We now have something that defines the rotation of our system and the um, and the kind of in internal deformation of the system. But it doesn't tell us anything that an engineer can use. Engineers need um, hard properties that can they can correlate to physical values that they can measure. So we need to define something called strain which is the most common engineering metric for measuring deformation. I'm looking around for a clock because I don't know. Oh, it's broken. Oh, it's okay, thank you. Um, well, this is my... cool. um, uh, and functionally, strain contextualizes a deformation gradient into something that can be used easily. So simplest definition, strain is just the change in length of the material being formed over the original length. That's the simplest engineering term. And to get that from our deformation gradient, we have this um, equation here, which is just transpose just plus original minus the identity matrix. Um, and this will come out to give us what this, what the actual strain we can use is. So going again with our torsion example, um, we have our d5 or dz, they only own zero component. Using our equation to get um, the new strain value, we take that through. And uh, what we find is, some, is something that looks like the original stretch tensor with this minus identity going down the, down the diagonals. Can I ask a question? Go for it. I somehow forgot, why do you add in the F transpose part? Why do you have F and F transpose? I forgot. That's a good question. It's been a while since I've taken the class, so I'm not sure I can remember exactly. But I believe the reason you do that is because that removes um, that kind of forces symmetry and it removes some of the purely rotational elements. And so it kind of removes some of the rotational part of however you're defining your, um, your axes, I believe. But that's a good question. I'm gonna to have to look that up afterwards just to be sure. Um, so, so this is great. We now have something that we can actually plug into an engineering law and get something that we can measure stress from. This is excellent. So we can do this by Hooke's law, which is the equation there at the bottom. Um, it uses uh, two factors called the elastic, or I'm sorry, the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio, which are very simple, very easy to measure. Um, the Young's modulus is just if you pull on a material with a certain strain, how much stress it will feel. It's really, really simple. You can do it on a teeny tiny piece of material. 
um, in a very controlled environment, but a very linear way. And then the Poisson's ratio, which is just, if you take a fully dense material and push on it, pull on it, how much it will either like, you know, squash out or kind of push in, so to speak. Um, and this is all related by that equation in the bottom right there. Um, and this is great because it gives us uh, the full stress straight, assuming only elastic deformation for this guy. Now, before we proceed, uh, something that's important to define and to think about for a matrix. So I've discussed kind of like how we solve these guys, how we're defining the deformation gradient, how we get strain from that, and then using uh, this equation here, how we get the stress, which is kind of the, the pressure felt inside the system. But important to think about what this means, first of all, before we proceed. So we have this matrix with on diagonal components, I, I, J, J, and K, K, and then off diagonal components. And the on diagonal components with common indices, I guess you would say, represent stresses and strains that are kind of uh, planar, or what we're, call we're calling hydrostatic to the actual inclusion that we're defining. So these are like traction vectors. They're essentially like um, perpendicular uh, strains or stresses in this case to the axis of the material. The off diagonals are what are called shear stresses. So it's like the um, on diagonal or hydrostatic represent kind of like pushes and pulls on the material and the off diagonal like the sigma two three or sigma two one or any of the other uh, ones that are off diagonals represent kind of like shears or kind of, um, kind of sideways deformation on the material. And this will be important because it's the shears actually that dominate deformation, but we'll see that later on. So just kind of an explanation of what the stress and strain matrix are representing and what all these little values mean. They represent on diagonal kind of like direct kind of pressures on the material, off diagonals kind of like shear stresses or kind of sideways stresses um, based on the axis for which they are defined. So anyway, back to the engineering. Um, we have this equation, we have our strain state, we can calculate stress from it. So Patrick looks up um, a bunch of tables uh, for what Poisson's ratio are and what uh, elastic moduli are for his material. And then he can use something called an FEM simulation to um, plot the stress as a function of all the different variables for his specific material geometry. So he can plot you know, everything from no stress up to a thousand MPA, which is really, really high for this material. And he finds that the only real dependence on any kind of variable is a dependence on R. And so he sees that as you go out from the center, you have uh, kind of an exponentially increasing kind of value in the stress here. Now, this is all very well and good, but it still hasn't answered our fundamental question, which is under a certain stress or under a certain series of conditions, when will our material actually break? When will it actually fracture? Um, which is to say, at what stress level will the material fail based on its properties? Um, now, in order to determine this, we can determine like a useful stress or a stress that will actually contribute to this specific failure. Um, now, up to this point, we've defined stress as kind of this three by three matrix with you know hydrostatic stresses and off diagonal kind of shear stresses. Um, but uh, these on diagonal kind of like hydrostatic stresses can be ignored for the most part when determining um, uh, deformation of material. And this is called the incompressibility condition. It basically means you can subtract out from the stress matrix the contribution from the summation of the hydrostatic stresses and get a result that is only the stress that's going to contribute to this kind of shear deformation. Um, when you're looking at fully dense kind of material failure, you're never gonna see volume change, which is like this left-hand side picture right here. You're only going to see a deviatoric deformation that conserves the volume because when you're twisting something, you're pulling something or you're smashing something with a hammer, you're not going to create new material in the process, meaning your volume will have to be constant. So you have to find a way to factor out any stresses and any strains that will conserve volume. And that's why this is important. That's why it's called the incompressibility condition because can't compress, can't pull apart, mm -hmm. equals MC squared, you can't create new matter. Um, uh, is that the right equation? I hope it is, whatever. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I think I covered everything on this slide. And the question arises, can this be summarized into a single useful or scalar quantity for material failure? Spoilers, it can. Um, 
And so in order to do this, we set up something called matrix invariance, which Sarah said you hadn't covered yet, but I think you will probably at some point in the future. If you don't, I'd encourage you to look it up because it's really, really cool. You can um, preserve certain properties of your matrix regardless of um, regardless of uh, like how you define your um, coordinate axes and regardless of your rotations. It's really, really useful. But essentially, it's a quantity that you can define with the equation above um, and matrix operations that will be constant for any kind of reference frame you define. Um, and you can solve this uh, by solving this equation. And you get something that is the first invariant, which is the trace of your uh, original matrix you're solving for. The sum of kind of three uh, determinants and then the determinant of your overall three by three matrix. Um, the second one is the one we're most interested in because if you do the math, you put this all in a single line in kind of a more standard equation form as opposed to matrix addition form. Um, you get something that looks like this on the very bottom. And qualitatively, this is a metric of the magnitude of stress in a component responsible for constant um, deformation. This effectively takes out the contribution of all those hydrostatic stresses and gives you a scalar quantity that is only representative of the um, of this S matrix or this deviatoric matrix. So it'll give you something that basically measures the magnitude of stress responsible for material deformation that conserves volume. And from this, um, you can define something called the bimesis stress, which is basically just that second tensor invariant multiplied by like three halves, I think, or wait, multiplied by, yeah, three, my mistake. Um, and what this does, it sets a scalar threshold for where the material is known to fail. And you can actually plot this in a three space of stress. So you have the initial hydrostatic and then second hydrostatic and third hydrostatic. And you get this kind of infinitely long um, kind of like tube, the surface of which represents a stress state where the material is known to fail, which is to say where the material is known to achieve yield stress and start plastically deforming. And this is used by all sorts of mechanical materials engineers to determine when a material is actually going to quote unquote break. Um, and so um, you can apply this to the stress state plotted in an FEM simulation and find uh, kind of where within your material you're going to find you know, stress that's going to break. So great, we now have something where we can determine material failure. Patrick plots this and what he finds is before the end of the radius of the material, he has stress that is going above that von Mises criteria. So he actually finds that you know, there's a ring around his material, there's a small kind of like husk or co-centric kind of hollow cylinder uh, where his material is known to fail. So this is obviously a problem. You don't want your material failing on doing operation. And he wants to know how this will be a problem and if he can improve it. Um, he wants to quantify how the material will permanently deform in response to stress it's under, how he can prove it, which is what I just said. Um, and he knows the conditions and materials under and has scoped out the best material for the job, but he wants to make it better. He wants to, if he can, eliminate this white ring so that none of the material will fail. So he calls up his colleague, Sandy, who's a material engineer, um, who knows all about these sorts of things and see if he can improve the material within this region. Um, and now we get into everything I just talked about was mechanical engineering. Now we get into material science. So obviously there was a lot of linear algebra up to this point. Not as much for the material science, but I think it's really cool. So I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, and there is a little bit, I promise. So, um, so the crux of material science is why microstructure matters. Um, it's understanding basically how um, and why a material's fundamental structure will affect its mechanical, electrical, piezoelectric, however you define its performance. And this is primarily done for metals, for ceramics, for crystals, for whatever material you find by looking at the nanostructure and seeing how you know properties of how the material is put together on a molecular level correlate to its continuum or kind of like engineering scale or broad scale kind of properties. So it takes mechanical engineering problems, contextualizes them, and then solves them by making a better material, quantifying where it will fail and determining how to improve its performance. Um, now, Sandy knows Patrick is working with a metal for the material that he's working with. So she knows right off the bat a couple of things about what he's looking at. 
She knows it's going to have a crystal structure, which basically means that atoms in a crystal will like to arrange themselves in kind of like a stacked oranges formation, uh, where they all kind of like organize into a self-repeating kind of like organized structure like this, with a repeating what's called a unit cell, which can be used to represent the structure of the whole material. Um, and she also knows that it won't look like this for the whole material. You're going to have clumps of crystalline material that are different orientations with boundaries in between them. And this is what we call grain. So you're going to have what's called a grain structure. So you're going to have a solid with a bunch of grains in it. And each one of those grains will contain a unit cell repeating um, with all of the atoms in your material. So you'll know that on a slightly larger length scale, you'll have um, these sorts of grains with precipitates with different kinds of phases and that will contribute to deformation. And this is what makes up kind of um, a metal, in this case, the steel that um, Patrick is trying to design for. Um, now she also knows that when you deform material enough, it will start to break, but it won't break immediately. It's going to deform slowly by a process called um, dislocation formation or dislocation kind of travel. And what dislocations are um, is kind of pockets or small kind of um, holes that form long linear kind of like, well not linear, but long kind of strings throughout the material of these kind of pockets um, or bubbles within the material that travel along low energy planes. So this is a what's called a 111 Shockley partial, which is a um, just a fancy name for a line defect that goes through a crystal. And basically what happens is the material kind of unzips and so you have the material kind of like popping from one lattice site to another lattice site to another lattice site. And slowly the material, as it pops through that whole line of um, atoms, it kind of shifts one atom over. And then another will come through and it'll shift another atom over. So metal doesn't so much snap as it does kind of like do like a bunny hop or a slow kind of unzipping effect. Um, you can actually see these if you look at these under a a microscope, um, like a TEM or something, something that can get down to the nanometer scale and see these kind of traveling and unzipping through the material. Um, and it causes these materials not so much to fracture, like I said, but creep, um, which just means kind of slowly deform. Um, now, Sandy also knows a couple more things about dislocations. She knows that dislocation mobility, so how fast these things can travel, may be seen as an activation or energy threshold problem wherein the mobility may be altered by a couple different things. The material chemistry, um, which is to say the different atoms that it sees, the different um, bonding energies that hold the crystal structure together might be stronger or weaker, depending upon the chemical makeup of your metal. Um, it might actually be impinged by obstacles. So if there's like occlusions or precipitates or alternate phases, um, you might have dislocations that kind of stop as they travel through and that will slow down dislocations. Um, and you can also slow down dislocation motion by crystal structure. So if you have like a really um, coarse structure with big grains like this, but you can somehow make it fine grain like this, you can diminish the average travel of a dislocation and therefore make the material a whole lot tougher, a lot you know, stronger against kind of stresses that make it want to break. Fine tuning these help fine tune material performance. Um, now, Sandy knows a little bit about the steel that Patrick's working with, and she knows that she can plot the phase structure in terms as a function of both the chemistry and the temperature in something called a phase diagram. Um, and from this, you can see that there's a specific um, concentration of carbon where she can get a substructure within the material called perlite. And this might look, and this is basically a lamellar structure where you have long strands of a phase called ferrite and a long strand of something called cementite. These are basically materials that both organize as crystals, but have different unit cells. So they have different crystal structures organized in different ways. Um, this also means that the energy required to nucleate and travel a dislocation in cementite is going to be very different from ferrite. And so they won't be able to pass dislocations from one to another, meaning they won't be able to actually co-deform, so to speak, at least not very easily. Um, and by fine tuning the carbon and by fine tuning the temperature at which you form your metal, you can make this sort of, sort of structure. Um, and the advantage of this is that the finer microstructure, like I mentioned, meant that it's very difficult for these dislocations of these plastic carriers to travel and cross between the barriers between the ferrite and the cementite. 
Um, because of this, even though this is almost identical to the chemistry and the microstructure of the original steel, it is both harder and stronger than the steel it's derived from, but it's not as tough, um, which means that uh, cracks can form and propagate more quickly, leading to faster failure within the pipe. Now, in this context, that's actually okay, because when you have a long material with a really, really tight tolerance. Um, you don't want it to plastically deform. You want it to either stay shape or break out right and need to replace it. You don't want to have like a slow warping or you have your wind turbine falling over and a bunch of lawsuits you don't want. So you want to avoid that if you can. Um, so in this context, having a brittle material that's stronger is actually better to have. So the material requires tighter tolerance and can't plastically deform. Better to break than change shape. Um, so from all this, she tells Patrick about all his chemistry, says, this is what I recommend, but perlite is kind of expensive to make. So rather than making the whole material perlite, uh, which is the original design, we'll take the material, we'll um, only make the outer part kind of a long sleeve of perlite by taking a tube or a bar that we form into a tube, putting it through the heat uh, process, and then slipping that over the original material, which is the untreated steel and then bonding them through a diffusion or heat bond, uh, which is a common engineering process to just kind of like, you know, bind two things together. That will eliminate this outer plastic surface um, and make the material completely open or completely uh, creep free, no plastic deformation, you know, problem solved. We now have a component that can withstand the stresses and strains that is defined. We've answered both engineering questions. So they present this to Mr. Krebs. He thinks it's a cool idea, he likes it, so he gives him a grant to develop it and work on it and make the component. And they're happy because they now have, you know, a plan for a component they can build and make and save the planet because they're working on the wind turbine. So that's my talk, I guess. Um, and just as final remarks, um, uh, good engineering inevitably uses a lot of linear algebra. There's a lot I couldn't go into here because of time with material science. There's kind of a lot, the nitty gritty of how dislocations move, but I was, It'd be too much to go into for now, but um, essentially a dynamic world will always need good engineers who can solve the world's problems with linear algebra. Um, so work hard, trust the math, and you get to work on really, really fun stuff like nuclear reactors or jets or whatever you feel like doing. So uh, yeah, thanks for listening. And I'll take questions now if you have <laughs> You can, you can never, yes, um, but you can never find all the properties. And so something I work with a lot in my job is like fine tuning microstructures to inhibit dislocation motion for certain irradiated and thermal properties. And that's kind of a black box, but you can find a lot of things like what I was talking about, like elastic modulus, Poisson's ratio, um, and even like fundamentals of continuum mechanics. So a lot of the math and actually some of the screenshots I pulled are from a great website called continuummechanics.org that goes into a lot of this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a cool site. Um, that goes into a lot of this stuff in more explicit details, offers proofs and even like some really, really cool like exercises and examples to go into. So yes, there are. Um, and I can email some after class. Oh yeah, absolutely. Could you repeat the question on Zoom? Yes. So, um, young man asked if um, there are ever experiments where you actually have to twist material to break it um, and find the properties there. And actually, yeah, one of my PhD colleagues when I was going through um, graduate school, he did a big project like this. We made an FEM simulation, did a lot of like fundamental calculations on dislocation dynamics and how something would deform. He then made a heat treatment with his material. I think it was like a ceramic something or other. I don't know. I'm a metallurgist. I don't know about ceramics. Um, and basically he said, this is how it will deform and this is when it will break. And then he actually twisted a bunch of bars and they all broke at different points because there's always going to be material irregularities. But he did a whole bunch of deformations, found the mean and the standard deviation and found that his calculations were like spot on. And so he did like a materials design 
with this twisting experiment. But you also have them in industry just to like get bulk properties. And so if you have a lot of money, you can like send a thousand bars to be twisted. And that happens sometimes too. So, yeah. Any questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I uh, noticed that a lot of things in the ceiling with uh, sorry. You're good. Sheer trends, like sheer stress. Yes. And, like the final draft was all about sheer. But if you were working in somewhere where you didn't consider multiple work techniques, could you be able to combine them all into like one value, or do you need to be separate? Great question. Okay. So, um, basically, when you do your deformation gradient tensor, um, a lot of slides, holy cow. Uh, when you do your deformation gradient tensor, the U component of this guy will actually calculate shear, hydrostatic, torsion, stretch, everything. All the components of the three by three matrix will capture the breakdown of all those different kinds of stretching and pulling components. And there's, again, on that continuummechanics.org website, they actually show how you can break this U matrix down into the different components for stretch and twist and even bending and so forth. And as a modeler, what you frequently have to do is know what conditions your material will be under and construct this U matrix so you can model it and then do statistics to find like what's the likelihood it's going to break and why under what stresses. And so absolutely, as a matter of fact, for aircraft um, and for like um, aeronautics engineering, there's a lot of components that are gonna be like, you know, vibrating and moving around a lot. And so you really have to like be able to define that really, really well. It's not something I'm super well versed in, but it, it is absolutely something you have to know a lot about, know how to deconstruct that. And so so uh, yeah, good question. Okay, let me ask you guys a question for a round up. So is there anything that you heard today that you're gonna go home and think is never that we should actually repeat it? Do you hear anything that Doug Steve said that we should remember? Or that you currently remember? Just to reinforce. Yeah. I guess I don't know like programs that can be used in the past, but it's always like roughly, but it's always been just put it in, set the material, and the magic box with the blinking light sitting on my desk or whatever. So it's really cool, like even these. And that's the beautiful thing is that um, even the most complicated engineering problem or physics problem or yeah, mathematics problem too, though I'm not as well versed in those, can very frequently be broken down into simple properties, fundamental equations. So much of complex engineering and stuff that's going on is just fundamental principles carried out to a real system. Um, if you learn the math and you work at the math and you work hard on understanding these fundamentals and you you know have some gumption and some chutzpah, um, you can you know carry these things to real world applications. It's it's actually really fun. It's it's quite satisfying to get to do this stuff when you when you hear the music as they say. So it's it's a good time. Is there anything else? Remember? Can you show your second to last slide? Uh, yeah. I have two questions. I think we should talk about the second to last slide says something almost contradictory to what I've been telling you. Okay. Yeah, because it says there, trust the math. What do I want to do? <laughs> don't trust me, right? I don't want your trust. I don't want your trust because I always want you to be thinking. Every, you're thinking about everything I'm going to say and check if it's right or wrong for yourself, right? Because someday you're going to be in the position where now I have to trust your mind, right? I'm going to be driving over your bridge or I'm going to be going under your power plant or whatever, right? So I want you to check carefully, right? So how do we reconcile this? This, this command, trust the map. How do we reconcile this with don't trust me? Yeah. By a lot of people, I think that's a really. I think that is where that we started this, right? You don't, you don't design alone. I think we're the worthy of writing down. Don't design alone, right? Because when you have a whole, if we all look at the problem together, we're a lot more likely to get it right. Yeah, really worth remembering. That's a good yeah. I don't know that he said this in the first part, but there's a number of chances that we do actually get the problem. Right. Yeah. 
calculations are reasonable. You can you repeat that on the Zoom too? Yeah. Well, I didn't hear the question. I think it was triple checking or something. Yeah, I was going to say using a number of checks after you reach your whatever calculation. That's absolutely the case. In fact, whenever I'm designing anything, whenever I'm working on any project, every time I'm recommending a change or I'm recommending a, um, an alteration to any design, it always goes through what's called a review process. And so I take what I've done and I, I show it to my colleagues. And sometimes it's usually people in the company, but if it's something specialized like irradiation damage or microstructure training for dislocation dynamics, like we bring in a panel of different people to check to check my math and to make sure what I did was actually correct, provable, and repeatable too, and that it's actually very, very well justified. So very good point, Sarah. You're actually completely correct, and you're right. There are, there are processes within like um, any engineering company, any, any technology company, if it's worth its salt, that is, um, for um, making sure any change that affects anything is like double and triple checked and that there's a really solid theoretical foundation, which is most of what I talked about here, but also like experimental foundation. So very important and good point for me too, absolutely. So why don't we quit there and then individual questions, it'll get a little bit of time for that too. But thanks again.